Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society. Good evening and, and welcome to this uh, forum on iPhone apps. It's a forum that's being sponsored by the Keller Center for Innovation in Engineering Education here at Princeton University by New Jersey Jumpstart, which is a group of individual, what we call angel investors that invest in young companies, and by uh, Drinker Biddle, which is a law firm that works with a lot of young uh, companies. And on the rear of your program, you'll see a description of not only the Keller Center, but also Jumpstart and Drinker Fiddle. Uh, what we're going to do this, e this evening is to uh, learn about how you can identify a new application for this new platform, the smartphone or the iPhone, and then how you could convert uh, what appears to be an interesting idea into a real application that could be part of a business. So w the way in which we're going to do that is learn from people who are doing it and have done it. And we're pleased to have uh, tonight five speakers, three right here, and two in remote locations through a, a video conferencing facility. Uh, Matt Connor, who uh, is on the uh, end, David Lieb, who's in Mountain View, California, uh, Sharon Fordham, who's in Hillsboro, New Jersey, Ken Kay, who's right here with us uh, in the flesh, and Harry Schmidt. And uh, without taking the time to uh, give a lengthy introduction uh, of each individual, I would just um, uh, uh, refer you to the program where you can read about not only uh, their backgrounds but the kind of companies that they're developing. My role here this evening is to be a moderator, but it's also to be a student. Uh, I must confess that I don't own an iPhone. I know people who do. <laughs> but uh, I understand that this represents a platform of enormous potential. And, and so this kind of a session where we can learn from people who are really blazing the trail in a new set of applications and creating enterprises based on those applications can be very valuable. The format that we will use is that I'll ask each of the developers to talk for five or seven minutes about not only their application, but how they conceived of it, how they developed it, how they plan to monetize uh, it, and maybe even talk about the uh, availability of venture capital and investments for uh, these uh, applications and these companies. And then after each of those presentations, we'll have a Q&A session. And because this is being recorded, we'll ask you to use a microphone. So when you have a question, and I recognize you will get a microphone to you so that the question can be captured on the uh, uh, video and, and distributed elsewhere. And I'm going to start this evening by uh, calling on Matt Connor uh, to begin telling uh, about his company. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me first? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm Matt Connor. I'm a student here at Princeton. I'm a junior in the uh, Operations Research and Financial Engineering Department, and I am also the co-founder of Iabetics, and uh, together, my brother's the other co-founder, together we have developed an application called Islet. Um, now, Islet's an application that's aimed to help um, diabetics manage their condition, and I think in understanding how we conceived of the idea and how we developed, it's important to understand just a little bit about diabetes, so we're just going to make sure you... Uh, bring up to speed on diabetes. Um, so diabetes is a disease that affects a person's ability to produce insulin. Um, 
and more specifically, Islet's designed to work with type 1 diabetics, which is a chronic medical condition in which the pancreas, for whatever reason, is attacked by the immune system, and the body's no longer able to produce insulin. Um, and insulin's an important hormone in uh, processing sugar. So as you might imagine, for diabetics, it's very difficult after they eat to make sure that their blood sugars stay in a balanced and proper uh, numerical range. Um, diabetics put themselves at severe risk if their blood sugars go too low of uh, coma, feeling faint, dizziness, and nausea. And if their blood sugars are too high, they run the risk of long-term complications. So for diabetics, it's very important for them to review how much they eat, the insulin that they're administering to themselves, and tracking their blood sugars. Now, the reason that we picked out the, this area to develop an iPhone application is a little different than probably most people start in that we actually weren't looking at this as a potential money-making business. Uh, I have several family members who are type 1 diabetics themselves, so our primary interest was in helping them have a device to better review their blood sugars and keep track of what they were doing so that in the future they could better manage their diabetes. Um, I also thought that by making this app I could collect some in interesting information for a thesis at some point, and I also thought it would be a uh, interesting chance to learn how to program an iPhone app. So our motivation was a little bit different, and of course it was it was intriguing that we could make money from it, but our primary motivation was a um, application that would help diabetics manage their condition. Um, now, our criterion for a good application based on that is one that will actually help them, so not just a logbook that won't help them make better decision, or we weren't looking to make an app that will make the most money. Our idea of a good app for a medical application like this is one that will really serve the purpose to help diabetics. So we, that's how we came up with the idea. Now, developing it was a little bit tricky because uh, neither my brother nor I have really ever programmed on the uh, Apple platform. We never used Cocoa Touch, and we didn't really know much about Objective-C. So what we had to do is we signed up to be developers with the iPhone program, which is $99, and downloaded a software developer kit, as well as um, it gives you access to iPhone development docs online. And uh, fortunately, what we were trying to do in making kind of an automated lab book that would let diabetics look back and see what they ate, the insulin that they took, and what their blood sugars were, it's pretty straightforward how we wanted to do that. We just wanted to capture data, save it, store it, and present it so that they could review that. Now, as time's gone on, we've added some functionality in terms of them being able to graph their results, do some analysis based on their blood sugar readings, their food, and their insulin intake, and all sorts of reports like that. But for, uh, primarily, it was pretty simple for us to develop it, and that we weren't trying to do anything too outrageous. We were just trying to get the results of their management onto a device so that they could look at that and review it. Um, so development for us was pretty simple, pretty easy. Um, but as you might imagine, there's not that many type 1 diabetics. So marketing an application like this has been pretty difficult for us in that the App Store is a really good place to distribute the app with, so I don't know how many people have an iPod Touch exactly. I think it's around 30 million or so. But, so lots of people can see the app, but we're targeting a really specific audience. So it's really hard to reach out in the App Store and target those people and say, hey, we have an application that would be really good for you. So the App Store for us is great if you're going to sell a lot, but it's really difficult for us to find um, the audience that we're targeting. So what we did to kind of try to raise some awareness was uh, we renamed the app a little bit. Because within the uh, application store, you can search based on uh, content. You can also search the name, so we named it Di Islet Diabetes Assistant. We talked to various doctors in uh, where I'm from in California just to tell them if they had any patients who had an iPhone or iPod Touch. Um, but for the most part, we've been pretty grassroots in that we haven't tried to reach out, and um, that's something that we are working on now, but it's been difficult for us to target our specific audience since it's difficult to uh, find the type 1 diabetics who have an iPhone. Um, now, with, with it being hard to find customers, it's obviously hard for us to make a consistent uh, amount of money since they, the way the application store works, you buy it once, and then that's all we get from them. So it's pretty difficult with us targeting a pretty small audience. 
to make any sort of ongoing revenue. So the way that we've approached monetizing our iPhone application has been to build a web database that syncs with the iPhone application. Now, there's two reasons we've done that. One is obviously if you sync up the information with a website, then now that's on the website, you can do lots of in interesting, th interesting things in terms of sharing that information. You can share it with doctors, you can review it yourself, you can do more interesting analytics and more powerful analytics on a computer than you can on a pretty small iPod or iPhone. So that was one goal was just to get the information onto a database that you can really, onto an online database so you can really look at your numbers, share that information with other people, and really work with those people to make better decisions managing diabetes. Also by doing that though is that you can, uh, you can charge people to sign up to a subscription website. So our, our approach has been that we're going to get people to download the app, they only download it once, but we need to get a con consistent revenue stream. And the way that we've gone about doing that is setting up a website from which, um, for which people sign up and we have a yearly revenue that we get from each person. Um, now, lastly, as you might have read in the uh, biography of me, it mentions that we've won a um, significant prize from Simit. So for us, looking for outside investors is not something that we've... Uh, We've approached yet just because the money that we've made from winning this Simit prize has proven substantial enough that we haven't needed any additional funding and at this time we haven't been interested in reaching out to those people. However, that money's proven really beneficial to us in that as we go forward here and we keep developing that, we think at some point we will be reaching out to the medical community at large, hospitals, insurance companies, etc., and trying to see that if our system is proven to help improve diabetes care, if we can get them to uh, invest some money and help us really get going. Um, just kind of sum up a little bit, for a medical app like Islet that's targeting, targeting a really specific audience, um, our criterion and the way that we came about the idea was a little bit different, that we were really more worried about developing a good app to help the customer more than make money, which might seem a little backwards and that a lot of people think money first, um, but we thought, especially with family members and everything, we were more interested in just developing an application that could actually help people rather than trying to make any money out of this. Um, and going forward from there, we've been pretty fortunate in, uh, in how it's turned out and how we've received some money from winning the Simit Prize to continue developing it uh, to a point that now we feel like we can build a way to make some money and continue developing it to even make it better for the customers. Thank you, uh, Matt. And uh, there's a lesson here that uh, I, I wasn't aware of the, your business model, but the notion that a, an app can create users and data that then can be uh, transferred to a database and shared and, and monetized in that way. So it's not just a one-time sale, but it can lead to an ongoing revenue stream. Uh, our next uh, developer and CEO is David Lieb, uh, class of uh, 03 from Princeton. He's in Mountain View. David? Hi, Ed. Yeah, uh, well, hello to everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. Let me know if you can. Um, I am a class of 2003. I was an electrical engineering graduate. Um, I will uh, just quickly kind of give you the, the background story on Bump um, and what we do and, uh, and what we're, we're doing next. Um, I'm going to try to do a live demo here um, over teleconference. We'll see how that goes. Uh, just to give you an idea of what Bump is. Uh, Bump is a way to connect two mobile phones by literally just bumping them together. Um, and so our iPhone app, uh, which is out now, uh, allows you to exchange contact information or photographs uh, with other people by literally just bumping your two phones together. Um, and wouldn't you know it, my live demo here has... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, while I uh, try to multitask and do that, I will uh, give you a little bit of the story about how, how we started with Bump. Um, you know, I was uh, in, in business school last year at the University of Chicago, um, and I found myself meeting a bunch of new classmates and uh, being forced to manually type their contact information into my phone. Um, and frankly, I just got frustrated. It was a, it was a personal frustration. Uh, I looked around and I saw, you know, all these people with these really smart phones that have all of this functionality, um, and there's no way to connect two phones, you know, with someone that's standing right next to you, and I just thought that was ridiculous. Um, so the idea for Bump uh, really hit me in accounting class one day while I was daydreaming. See, there is uh, important parts to, uh, to accounting. Um, <laughs> and 
You know, uh, that, that night I emailed a, a colleague of mine from when I was working as an engineer at Texas Instruments who uh, happens to also be a Princeton graduate, Andy Hybert's class of 1992. Um, and we started kicking around the idea of how do we build this system? Uh, you know, should we use iPhone? Should we use Android to, to do a you know, first demo? Uh, we chose iPhone mainly because uh, of the number of phones that were out there that we could test this on. Uh, and also the development environment. Um, it's very simple. You know, there's, there's one piece of hardware uh, one software development platform that you can develop on and be sure that it will work on, on the millions of phones that are already deployed. Um, so, so we went about building the bump system. I'll, I'll give you a bit of a background on how bump actually works. Uh, a lot of people think it uses technologies like Bluetooth or other peer-to-peer uh, -peer local technologies, and it, and it does not. Uh, bump actually monitors the accelerometers in the phone, um, and it literally feels the bump when, a, when a two phones bump each other. It sends that information up to a uh, server, and our server does this global uh, matching algorithm to figure out which two phones in the world uh, felt the same bump at the same time in the same place. Um, so it's a pretty intricate solution to what should be a, a very you know, simple problem. Um, so here I'm going to try to do my live demo and see if it will work. So uh, can you guys see, here's, here's uh, one phone running bump, um, and it allows you to select some information that you'd like to share. Um, and then I will uh, bring this other phone into view here. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just literally bump the two phones together. Um, and in a couple seconds, they'll identify each other. And then uh, each user can choose to accept or not to exchange contact information or photo or anything like that. Um, so we released Bump uh, really just as a test to see if people would engage in this new type of behavior. Uh, it's, it's kind of funky when you first think about it, when, when two people you know, bump their phones together to connect. Um, we, we released the app at the end of March, and uh, frankly, we were just stunned at how quickly uh, it took off. Um, you know, we got some early press uh, with, with the Chicago Tribune. Uh, that rolled into some more blog posts. Um, and eventually, you know, things started to, uh, to really take off. One of the differences with Bump compared to other iPhone apps is that, you know, by, na by its nature, it requires two people to interact um, and to use it. So each person that downloads Bump has uh, an incentive to spread it to his friends so that it becomes more useful for him. Um, so I think that, you know, that aspect of it made it a lot more viral and allowed us to grow early on. Um, at the end of April, we happened to become the billionth app downloaded from the Apple iTunes App Store. So. That was a, a, bit of, uh, a bit of luck that really helped us uh, get onto the national scene, and we got a few national uh, you know, news, news articles from that. Um, and we kind of leveraged that into you know, more growth. Um, in, uh, in August, I guess it was, or July, Apple approached us, and, and they wanted to feature us in one of their iPhone commercials. So we, uh, we did that, and, and things have really exploded since then, since, uh, you know, since more people have been aware of Bump. I think now we have about six million downloads on iPhone, which is uh, you know at the, one, towards the top of uh, all of the iPhone apps that have ever been downloaded. So we're very fortunate, uh, fortunate there. Um, moving forward, you know our, our plan is to use Bump as a core technology or a core platform um, to do any type of interaction between two people using your mobile phone. Um, so we're going to going to add features to the existing Bump application. Uh, that will make it you know, more useful in, in a very variety of situations beyond just exchanging contact information. Uh, we're also going to spread to other platforms. Uh, just last night, we released on the Android platform, um, and we'll be moving to other platforms beyond that as we go forward. Uh, but, our, but our main goal and our vision is to become the ubiquitous technology that people use when they want to interact using their mobile phone. Um, so, so Ed asked us to talk a bit about uh, revenue models. Um, we we don't you know we're not actively pursuing revenue at the moment. Uh, we have a lot of ideas of how we can uh, monetize this technology and this platform. Uh, but really, you know, all of those ideas are predicated on the, the fact that we become a ubiquitous standard and, and the way that people uh, connect uh, using their mobile phones. So we're focused first on getting users and usage, and then we will uh, turn on some of these revenue models. Um, but you know, I think that business model you know, or that approach 
uh, works best for us because we are a business that really relies on becoming a uh, monopoly or a standard. Um, if, this, if this market fragments, it's really less valuable to everyone involved. So our first goal is to become that, that uh, ubiquitous standard. Um, in, in terms of uh, taking outside investment, uh, we recently closed on a, a $3 million Series A uh, round led by Sequoia Capital. Um, I think you know it was easier for Bump to do that uh, compared to some other iPhone applications. Um, one, because we had a lot of traction in the marketplace. I mean, we have you know, 6 million people actively using Bump all the time. Uh, that, that shows that, one, the technology works, and two, the market is there to a certain extent uh, for usage. Um, and I think the, the other aspect of Bump that allowed us to you know, have, have a good, uh, good fundraising time here is that uh, you know, Bump is a, is a platform technology that can be used for a variety of things. Um, and so each venture capitalist that we pitched, you know, each, each one of them was able to you know, imagine what the possibilities could be with our technology rather than us having to explain it to them and have them decide whether they believe us or not. So, you know, having an open-ended business like we do, I think, really benefited us there. Um, so I think maybe I'll, I'll leave it with that and, and look forward to answering your questions as we go forward. Thanks very much, David. Uh, exciting story of a Princetonian out in Silicon Valley uh, after a stop in Chicago doing some very interesting things, and congratulations. I didn't get my half MBA uh, from Chicago, so <laughs> I, I'm halfway there. And, uh, and also congratulations on the financing. Uh, the next uh, uh, speaker is Sharon Fordham, and uh, she's speaking to us from Hillsboro, New Jersey. And uh, she's been involved in a, a wide variety of companies. And I'll just ask her to talk about what she's doing now. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. Can you hear me all? Yeah. Yep. Can Fine. You hear me? Okay, great. Yep. Sorry, I was going to be there tonight, but I uh, had a little, uh, little mishap yesterday. My foot has uh, not been the same, so I'm having a little travel difficulty right now. But thank God for video technology. Um, so uh, you heard about two apps that are that are in um, different verticals. Uh, they're two applications. Uh, the Skyworks company, Skyworks Interactive, is actually a gaming company. It's a, it's actually the company that pioneered the, the general category of advertising over the years, which is the ability to build actually build advertising into what we call casual gaming, casual games or light light games that are generally played, uh, of course, online. Um, we have we started developing for the iPhone uh, in November a year ago. So it's exactly a year we've been out. Uh, we have well over 30, 35 apps at this point, uh, and we've had you know some success on the iPhone. We've been we've been pleased so far. We have a lot a lot more work to do. Um, so far, we've had 15 top 100 games, uh, and that's that's uh, significant because there's over 50,000 games right now on the available for the iPhone and over 100,000 apps. So I'm uh, just say finding something like looking for a needle in a haystack. I'll talk about that in the marketing side in a minute. Um, we've generally been in the top five among uh, top uh, <clears throat> publishers on the iPhone um, throughout the uh, time we've been on the phone. Uh, 13 million downloads uh, across a uh, number of our games. Uh, and we also serve advertising. We're doing about a half a million to a million game sessions per day, about 60 million air impressions per year. So we're starting to build a pretty significant presence on the iPhone, and, and that certainly is part of our goal. We also, um, as uh, David suggested, are starting to take our games across platform. We will be introducing our first uh, Google phone uh, very shortly. We're coming out with uh, DSI titles very shortly, and we'll be coming out with four to five PSP Go titles. So our, our games travel across many, many platforms, and that is part of the vision of what we have to do. Um, there are a lot of challenges uh, to being to being on the iPhone, uh, particularly in a, in a very very competitive category like gaming. Uh, you know, let's face it, we're playing with the inland the giants, with the electronic parts of the world, the gaming parts of the world. Um, and uh, interestingly, though, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, did someone say something? Yeah. Okay. Um, interestingly, though, there are an awful lot of game major game developers like Activision and Disney that really have not gotten on the iPhone yet. Uh, and that presents opportunities for developers like Skyworks, where if you have great products and you have a breadth of titles and uh, you have the right channels, you know, you become hopefully an attractive acquisition candidate at some point in time. 
So some of the questions, that, and, and by the way, our, our titles, our verticals are, are pretty straightforward. We're extremely strong in arcade, we're very strong in the arcade game, we're very strong uh, in the sports games, and we're very strong uh, in, in family. And that's important because it goes to the heart of how you're going to market and, uh, you know, kind of the titles you're looking for. It so happens those are strengths of the Skyworks company, uh, and we do Hallmark titles like, uh, as an example, ping pong, we're now table tennis, World Cup table tennis, which has been a huge success for us. Um, and likewise, arcade hoops, uh, arcade bowling, which you would know as speedball, a speedball type game. And uh, uh, those kind of titles uh, do have, have a lot of lift, a lot of consumer attraction. <coughs> uh, so much question that we were asked to tackle was how do you conceive of good iPhone apps? I can't, I, I'm talking to this question from the standpoint of a developer that has a line of products, not just a single product. So I'm, I'm going to come at it perhaps a little differently. Um, we start with looking at our catalog. We have a huge catalog, about 150 games that have been built over the years um, for online purposes. And so our challenge has been to identify within a large catalog how many titles, what titles we want to translate, and then do a build. We do actually have to do a, you know, a reasonable amount of work yet to take an existing online title and translate it. The iPhone is Objective C, that's very different programming languages. That language that than what our original phone, uh, our original games were built in. Um, so that work has to go on. Um, and, but, but at least we have, we have a great core of games to start with. Um, one other thing you want to look for is, is, is finding and matching your game with the demographic of the machine. And this is an interesting question as you think about channels. Uh, the iPhone user tends to be 15, male 15 to 44, or thereabout. <coughs> Um, so, kitty titles, as an example, don't do as well, they're just not a big category because younger children don't generally have iPhones or even necessarily iPhones. Some do, of course, but, but generally speaking, that's not the case. Um, but, if you go to a device like the DSi, uh, or the, any of the Nintendo handhelds or Sony handhelds, um, Nintendo in particular tends to be younger. So, titles that might not do well on the iPhone may well have a chance of doing well on the DSi. And so be very mindful as you're developing who it is you're developing for and make sure you match the, the, the program of, of your app to the need of, the, of that user. Um, in our case, we also have the luxury of having been in many different sites and having, and having been able to, to track uh, the traffic to each of our games in, when we presented many games on the website, like Portal as an example. And so we, we, are, we have the luxury of being able to look and see what we've done before and we're, we're, what titles have done really well and support the really strong titles and then be a little bit more uh, cautious about the titles that have been lower traffic uh, in our prior experience. Um, and then the last thing I would suggest is that you want to spend some time thinking about what your strengths are as a developer, what you bring to the party, and, uh, and stick to those strengths. Don't try to do something just because it's, you, you feel like it's the right way to go. Unless you can acquire the capability, you may be disappointed that you can't actually deliver what you think. I mean, in our particular case, as I said, um, we have done very well in arcade, in sports, and in family type of titles. Um, but we've also tried uh, areas like action, which is not a core strength of the, of the Skyworks company, and we haven't done particularly well. Uh, and in puzzle, we've had a mixed experience. Puzzle category is a very, category is a very big category. It's one we want to do better and we want to have more presence, but we've got a long way to go before we we uh, do there what we've done in some of the other verticals. Um, so just know what you're good at and make sure you leverage that and, and try to find your best presentation of that in the application. Um, another question was posed is what are the characteristics of a good application and what criteria should we apply uh, to de determine whether this, uh, the app will be, uh, will have potential to do well or not? Um, this, is a <laughs> this is a wide open uh, question and I'm sure many, many people can and should weigh in on it. In our experience, the number one thing, and to be honest, I, I, it's not totally different than any other category. The number one thing is you have to have a great product. And you just really don't see in the top 100 games too many uh, two-star rating games, two-star two rated games, generally speaking, or three, three and a half, four. I've seen an occasional four and a half that's very, very unusual. You never see a five. Uh, but three and a half and four is kind of the standard for, for getting in and staying in the top 100 uh, among the games. Um, secondly, to my point earlier, uh, if, you know, to the extent you can, pick a, a, a larger segment because the bigger the segment, the bigger the, the consumer interest in your type of game or app. 
And uh, if you have a choice between playing in a smaller segment or playing in a bigger segment, there will be a volume difference depending on which you choose. Uh, another thing you might want to be mindful of if you're thinking about what type of app you want to do or what type of game in our case you'd like to do is pay attention to the number of direct competitors. In gaming, because of the sheer number of games, uh, there in almost any game you can think of, there are direct competitors. And so, and it could be many, many competitors. If there's a large number of competitors, it's going to be very hard to break through, even with a real good application. Um, and if there are a limited number, your chances are, are better, and you can do things to enhance your, your, your game vis-a-vis -vis the competition. Um, you know, as an example, when we introduced we arcade bowling, which again is a school type of game, uh, we could we could have just done a more traditional arcade presentation. You all play the game; it's, it's you know it's a favorite for everyone. But we we actually put laser light uh, ski balls or or um, bowling balls uh, for the you know for the alleys, and we put in all kinds of neon and, and, and electrical um, sort of effects. That created a very exciting application, and it's a very, very popular app, and has been for um, since we launched it, which was December of last year, and since the top 100 performer. Um, and uh, all that said, it, it, there's, there's still this uncomfortable feeling of it's there's no easy pre predictor of what it is that's going to make a great application, a great game. Uh, and to some extent, it is a little bit of a large, large numbers exercise. Uh, you know, you're going to try a few things and. Some people work, sometimes you get lucky and it's, you know, it's that very first app. But, you know, over, over the course of 10, you know, apps, if you, you could go that direction, you try to create a portfolio of, of, of applications, uh, you know, you're gonna have the challenges trying to constantly, you know, pick the next big hit. Um, and just a few other things, just wanna scroll down here for a minute. On the marketing side, because I'll talk to that, um, that's kind of my area. Uh, how do you create awareness um, for your app and how are apps distributed? Well, the first comment is, unfortunately, it's becoming increasingly difficult to create awareness because there's just an enormous amount of competition in, in the iPhone App Store. Uh, I don't know if, if all of you are aware of this, but within the last few days, Apple just hit, uh, within about a year and a half of launching the App Store, uh, you know, they, 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 they cleared their, their brilliant uh, download, uh, and now they're up, and they just hit the milestone of 100,000 apps in the App Store. That's a monumental amount of competition. Um, we go into a, into a grocery store, and I, it's my background, I can tell you, there might be 40,000 items on the shelves of a grocery store, and they're in all different categories. Imagine um, 100,000 items in a grocery store and maybe the equivalent of 10 or 15 categories. I mean, it's just, it's mind-boggling. Um, so, but there are things you can do. Like one is to try and bring your, 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 uh, your application, your game. We actually put a Skyward brand on every icon that we put out in the marketplace, and uh, our users come to look for it. And uh, when we do, uh, when we launch new, new games, uh, we push it out to them in terms of the awareness of the new game, and uh, we get a lot of uptake as a result of it. They value the Skyworks brand, they have expectations about what the Skyworks brand is going to be. And if it doesn't, if a game doesn't meet those expectations, they tell us, believe me. <laughs> Um, online advertising uh, within iPhone ad networks is certainly viable, and, and that's being done pretty poorly by everybody. We um, have, again, a very large um, Skyworks community, 13 million downloads, and growing quite rapidly each day. Um, but we, we market to our users pretty aggressively, and we get a lot of uptake uh, on new titles as a result. So we were very efficient in how we go to market. Um, but other things, uh, reviews, getting out to the reviewer community, the blog community is huge, uh, and you have to have an active program to, to reach out and to and to interest uh, those those users. Uh, you know, um, releases of new of, of, of changes in your in your applications actually is a major way, interestingly, of reconnecting uh, you know, with your users with new users who maybe didn't have a phone when you first introduced the application, but do now. Uh, you know, if you make a change in an application, um, you know, you, you add a feature as an example, you get you get a release, ex you get release exposure for a day or so, and and, and believe it or not, it, it, you'll see volume moves as a result of that. Uh, pricing and a lot of pricing flexibility. Uh, Apple will change pricing instantly at your will. That's that's a great thing. Uh, ECRM, email marketing is usually important, uh, and you know, getting to know your community and finding who your users are. Uh, to the extent you can do that, uh, it is very valuable. 
Thank you. Sharon, thank you. Thank you for the insights, and, and I know you've probably raised uh, some questions in the minds of uh, people, especially on this marketing, but uh, what I found particularly interesting is the concept of transporting existing content to the iPhone, but making sure that the demographics of the uh, target customers are those that are iPhone users, and that was a very useful uh, insight. The ne next speaker is Ken Kay, and Ken, um, he, he's been an entrepreneur, but he's been a, an angel investor uh, for many, many years, and now after being on the sidelines as an investor with the uh, Jumpstart Network and a leader of the Jumpstart Network, is back uh, on the playing field uh, building a company. So tell us about it, Ken. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, I think my background is probably a little bit different in that um, I've been in the software um, company uh, development business for a long time. Uh, the first company I, I built up and sold to Microsoft, uh, Joanne Pinter is here. Joanne was one of the early employees at ebudgets.com uh, before uh, it, we grew it and it sold it to uh, Microsoft. She recently left Microsoft to join, join Dow Jones. But... Um, with my experience in software development, uh, business development, and uh, angel uh, investing, you were probably going to uh, expect that I, I arrived at this idea, this approach, this business with, a, uh, uh, with the uh, experience of, uh, of many trials, uh, uh, many uh, uh, failures, as well as successes. Well, it turns out the main reason I got into this was because of Joan. Joan, would you please stand up? Joan is uh, my friend, and she and I, about a year ago, um, after I uh, got, got an iPod for my software development team at the company I was, uh, um, I was uh, helping out with, I, I became fascinated with the iPod and uh, started thinking about uh, different um, sustainable businesses that you could create. Now, at the time, and, and it's largely true today, most of the apps that you, you download are, um, are throwaway apps, and this is uh, by no means uh, uh, discrediting what Sharon has done in building a, a very uh, impressive business on the game uh, side, but uh, I, I certainly don't have a background in gaming, and so I was thinking about a way to build something that would appeal to um, a target audience in such a way that I can create a sustainable model, and that was not an easy thing to do. <clears throat> now... Um, because Joan is in the uh, arts world in Philadelphia, um, she and I talked about various uh, ideas that might make sense for nonprofit arts organizations. And this, uh, I think, would violate all of the rules that I've uh, developed as an angel investor, and that is targeting a, a market that has absolutely no money is not a good idea <laughs> <laughs> to build a business. Uh, at the same time, um, I had uh, in Joan a connection into that market, and uh, um, through the context, uh, a good understanding of what might appeal to them. So I started exploring that area, mainly to, to just get into the game. I, I had heard about the iPhone party, and I didn't want to miss out. Uh, so I wanted to get into the game to figure out what the right questions are. Uh, often, um, you don't really know what the issues are until you get into it. So I wanted to develop an app, get it into the app store, and see where the journey would take me. So I had absolutely no business model, uh, no real um, uh, faith that this would end up as, as a real business, but I wanted to do it because it was cool technology. Um, so um, the first thing I did was uh, uh, I tried to figure out how to develop the app um, with limited resources. I wasn't about to throw a lot of money at this. Um, I looked at uh, outsourcing to China, uh, and after working with this programmer for about a month, I realized that uh, he didn't know very much. And so at that point, I was in a dilemma. <clears throat> iPhone app developers were very hard to find, and if you could find one, they, were, they would probably not stay with you for very long because they could be... Uh, uh, stolen by uh, someone else. What's the solution? I asked my son, who is here? David, stand up. <laughs> David is a uh, part-time student, a full-time gamer, 
and uh, a part-time programmer for EC, the, the company I, I'm creating. So as you can see, this is uh, more like a ma and pa operation than a real business. But uh, nevertheless, I'm very excited about its potential. And let me explain some of the things I've learned along the way, some of the key questions that, uh, that I have uh, wrestled with. Um, the main problem in uh, an iPhone app is, is not in development, it's in marketing. Uh, it's not easy to get a good iPhone developer, but marketing is becoming an astronomical challenge for the reasons that Sharon uh, talked about, the number of apps out there, the, the sheer amount of chaos and noise in this marketplace. So uh, either you have to have a lot of money or you have to come up with a viral strategy that uh, will uh, resonate and, and catch on, catch fire somehow. And in the arts world, I believe I found an opportunity to do that. And here's, here's why. While they might not have money, what they do appreciate is um, the technology. They, they would like to get on the mobile platform to reach their audience and possibly uh, connect with a younger market that would then be their future donor, donors. Um, the fact that they don't have money means that they are constantly promoting themselves. So what I'm trying to do now is to develop a strategy whereby um, for the nonprofit arts world, it's a free app. They can get their content, oh, and I should explain what the app does in a minute, but they can, they can use this to get a presence on the iPhone store reach their audience, and possibly get more uh, uh, contributions to their, to their cause. The app itself is a platform which takes uh, content and uh, puts it into a format that can be a mobile guide to a, uh, an arts festival. Uh, it could be a mobile magazine or a newspaper. Uh, it's very open-ended, and through the web portal, uh, the users and organizations can put their content out there uh, at which point uh, anybody with an iPhone can get access to their content. Now that can be done either as um, an EC app, uh, which is what the app is called, or a private label version, which is appropriate for large organizations. So uh, whereas um, the app itself is, uh, uh, is not really uh, sustainable uh, by, by itself, but with the uh, content and the promotional backing of arts organizations, uh, I hope that it can uh, reach uh, a much larger audience than I can possibly do with my own resources. So I'm trying to take advantage of, of uh, the nonprofit arts world, both in Philadelphia as well as the rest of the country, initially in Philadelphia, uh, to uh, get the uh, message out and uh, to, in effect, sell the shovels to the gold miners. Rather than look for gold, sell the shovels. Uh, that's basically the approach that, that I'm taking. Thank you, uh, Ken. And, and uh, it really does come in handy, doesn't it, to have a son that <laughs> can do, do this? Uh, that's a, a wonderful story. Uh, Harry, uh, tell us your story. Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> I could just start out by saying that uh, I began uh, my life in programming as one of the sons in one of these sort of father-son operations. But... Um, uh, my project uh, operates on a very different level from uh, the other applications that you've heard about today, um, in part because they are really just tools for academics. They're research tools, and there is absolutely no possible hope of uh, any meaningful monetization of these applications, um, because what money is there in academics? Anyway, um, my applications are called Lexidium and Lexiphanes, and what they are are uh, simply dictionary search tools for uh, the ancient Greek and classical Latin languages. I'm a fourth-year PhD candidate um, in uh, classical studies here at Princeton University, um, and my day job is that I study uh, ancient Greek tragedy and um, then try to teach it to undergraduates. Um, my applications began um, with me sort of saying to myself, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Um, on a trip to Italy, um, a little bit more than a year ago, uh, my wife, who's also a classicist, um, was engaged in a program in uh, Rome taught by the Pope's Latin secretary, uh, which is kind of esoteric. It's for people who want to learn to speak Latin. Uh, 
At any rate, uh, the one textbook that uh, the, the students were expected to bring with them to Italy was uh, this very ancient, very venerable, and very, very large dictionary, the Lewis and Short Latin Dictionary. Now, I already knew that uh, this dictionary has long since been put in machine-readable format, XML format, uh, because it's in the public domain um, and made available for free download. But not very many tools have been uh, developed that actually take advantage of that facility. And so I said to myself, there's going to be a better way for my wife to learn to speak Latin than to be wandering around in baking in the Roman sun in the middle of July, carrying around a 20-pound dictionary. Um, at the time, I, we didn't yet have iPhones. We had a Windows mobile device. So I tried to develop a dictionary tool uh, for Windows mobile. And what I found was that uh, it's extremely difficult to do anything meaningful on the Windows mobile platform. The tools for development are all either difficult to obtain or extremely expensive. Um, and we ended up developing um, a sim very, very simple dictionary search tool uh, before we left, but it wasn't necessarily all that useful. You simply type a word in, and eventually, you know, many minutes later, you'd get a response back. Um, so I said to myself, there has to be an easier way of doing this. Uh, when we got back from uh, our trip, I began looking into the, uh, the iPhone platform as a place to uh, develop uh, research tools of this type. And I found, or what I found was that Apple had made it so simple for a single part-time developer like myself to create useful, practical, and helpful tools. Um, now, for those of you who don't know exactly how the iPhone application development platform works, um, you've heard already that you pay about $100 um, and you're given access to Apple's software development kit, which you have to run from a Macintosh. Um, but it provides all the tools, all the resources you'll need. There's plenty of documentation on how to use um, uh, the SDK, the software development kit. Um, and what I found was that it was very, very welcoming. I'm an experienced programmer. Um, I did not know the Objective-C programming language when I got started, but it was very simple to learn. Um, and in the space of about three months, I went from having the idea and having developed it already on Windows Mobile to having um, a useful and practicable tool uh, for the iPhone. Um, Distribution for uh, a tool like this is an incredibly difficult thing to manage, of course, because uh, you're trying to look for two, uh, two very comparatively small subsets of people, you know, iPhone, iPod touch owners on the one hand, people who are interested in classical languages on the other. Uh, not very large target demographics. My user base numbers in the thousands rather than the millions. Um, so what I found for, in terms of marketing and as an academic is that word of mouth works actually very well and social networking works even better because the people who have iPhones, the people who are likely to get a type of tool like this are also the people who are using um, Twitter, are using uh, Facebook, all of the new uh, social networking tools of our era. So I found simply that through judicious application of these tools, you know, create a page on Facebook, um, create uh, word of mouth, things like that. Um, it became very simple to get people actually downloading and using these dictionary tools. And the result is that I have now many thousands of people not only using these dictionaries but giving back um, in that it's possible for them to, um, because these, are, uh, these dictionaries, when they were made machine readable, it was all done automatically and there were sometimes uh, errors in the computer's transcription, made it possible for people to edit entries for, um, uh, each, for words um, and send their... Uh, changes back up to the cloud. So I've actually been able to get a lot of, um, of help in terms of cleaning these dictionaries up and making them more usable for everyone. Um, and then I can simply send those back down in, um, in application updates on the iPhone. So, you know, as a one-man dog and pony show um, and a, kind of a single part-time developer, uh, what I can say is that Apple has, is, like I said, Apple has made it so simple for people like me to do what, what they do, to create a little bit of value um, that a couple of people will find useful, that a few thousand people will be able to find useful, but to do it very quickly, to do it for very little initial outlay of, um, of capital, of money, or of time resources. Um, and uh, to that extent, uh, I think that really is where the, the potential of the iPhone and the iPod Touch uh, platform is, is that it's just so simple to develop and distribute that you know, even a, a, a single little academic guy like me can get a lot of traction for uh, uh, a couple of tools that you might have thought were, were very niche items. But um, uh, in that respect, I think I've been able to do very well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Harry. What, one of the things that I noticed, and you probably did too, is how uh, many of these applications came from a personal need. You know, Matt and, and Ken and, 
and uh, Harry, and, and, and to a large extent David as well, where they saw a need and then developed the application because they recognized that that need would be shared, maybe not by everyone in the world, but by uh, a, a large number of people to make it uh, interesting. Now it's uh, your time to uh, ask questions of any or all of the uh, panelists. And we have a, a, a microphone that uh, will enable your question not only to be heard by the audience, but to be uh, recorded uh, in the uh, video. And there's a question. I hate to have you running way up and way back, Cornelia, but <laughs> I'm going to recognize the gentleman in the, in the rear there uh, to ask the first question. Uh, this is the question for Mr. Pei. Um, you, you know, you left this hanging because you said there's a, there's a great way to hold on to uh, iPhone developers. And I, th I don't think you followed up on that. So yeah, what, uh, what did, you, you asked your son and what did he well, say? He, he, <laughs> I, I didn't give him much choice in the matter. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess he could be uh, bribed to uh, work for somebody else. Uh, I just felt that I had a little bit more leverage with him given that I'm paying his college tuition, oh, then uh, with uh, the off-the-street program. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, right right here. Cornelia, you can maybe hand... hand. Yeah. Oh, where, well, that, you and, and then uh, you'll be next. Okay. Uh, my question is for David. Uh, you did Y Combinator. Can you comment on that? And... Uh, was that a good experience for you? Hey, could you repeat that for me? Uh, sure. You did Y Combinator, I believe. Is that correct? Can oh, you comment yes, on yes, that? Yes. Is the question, what, what's the question about? The, the question had to do, David, with being uh, either as part of or near Y Combinator. very seed stage investment firm, um, kind of like the startup incubator or accelerator program. Uh, they basically give you know twenty thousand dollars of investment to uh, to typically you know young people who have ideas, um, and they spend the summer developing those ideas and, and seeing what they can make of them. Um, yeah, be, being a part of YC was really uh, a fantastic experience for us. Um, you know, we moved out to the to the Bay Area because this is kind of the, the hub of technology and where we need to be to to get employees, to get investors, and things like that. Um, being a part of YC really helped connect us to the, the network that we needed to recruit from, um, to get ideas from. So, so it's this kind of network of you know innovative software developers uh, that, that really helps a lot. Next question, I think, right, right here in the. <laughs> it's a little awkward. Thanks, Cornelia. Hi, this question is for David. Um, I was wondering, um, Bump seems to have a client-server model. It, was there a technical reason why you couldn't do a peer-to-peer -peer model? Or is, uh, was it because uh, Bluetooth was not available at the time or some other reason? Okay. So, so the question is about Bluetooth, I, I think I heard. Um, yeah, the reason, you know, we don't use Bluetooth, um, there's a couple reasons. So, one reason is that uh, you know Bluetooth is a technology that works great for what it was intended for, uh, which is you know making connections to peripheral devices like uh, Bluetooth headsets and things like that. It's actually a very poor technology for these types of uh, you know quick connections between two devices that might not have been paired previously. Um, you look at Apple's implementation of Bluetooth, and, and Apple you know is the, the one company that can do things you know the, for the, with the best user experience. And uh, their Bluetooth implementation really isn't that good. Um, taking Bluetooth and having one phone connect to a phone on a different network or a different uh, handset manufacturer and having Bluetooth be that connection is nearly impossible. Um, so, so we decided that we wouldn't rely on a hardware solution. We would create a software solution that could do the same thing um, with the standard hardware that, that you know, the, the hardware stack and the particular chipset in the phone didn't really matter. Question? Right here. Um, my question could be actually be for any of you guys. Um, 
my question, I'm, I'm new with Apple and, and kind of this app thing. How do you guys figure out cost? Um, does Apple, does, do they buy your app or do you make so much sense on the dollar for everything that sends? Or do you guys, um, and then also, how do you decide what you sell it for? Because most of them are 99 cents and then, you know, there's some that are, you know, 299. My question is just how you go, you know, how you began um, kind of in that realm. You take that question of you know the, the mechanics of uh, dealing with uh, Apple in order to market or sell distribute the products. Yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, you set your pricing. Uh, Apple does not. And I will just actually back up for a second because it's kind of interesting. But certainly on the gaming side, where there's long been um, some history of monetizing uh, apps developed by game companies. Um, in the past, it was, it was a very, very tiny amount of return for the development costs of, of online games. And Apple actually created a breakthrough by uh, actually giving developers a 70% cut of revenue share of every game they, they produced and developed and, and uh, ported to the iPhone. Uh, so basically, you set your price, and whatever the price is that you set, you keep 70%. Apple keeps 30% for the distribution, uh, and to some degree, we're in creation uh, for you know for your, your application. Uh, and as far as how you set the price, uh, again, there, there are no many rules. Uh, there are no firm rules. I, I mean, the only firm rule is you can get whatever the market will bear. Uh, but oftentimes, if there if there's no competition, you, you have a lot of latitude. But where you do have competition, you have to be mindful of whether things are so much better that you can price above the range of established competitors, or if there's already so many, even if you have great applications, you may have to still come in, in under that in terms of price. And also there's a model, frankly, out there which is no price at all. It's only free application uh, driven by advertising. And that is becoming more and more viable. I'm not sure it's fully viable yet, but the end market is starting to recover, and uh, the iPhone space, from an advertising perspective, is actually quite hot. So, so um, in our case, we actually do both. We have transactional revenue for the purchase of, of a paid application, and then for many of our apps, we also do a white version, which is a partial um, treatment of the full paid application, uh, and they carry, that carries advertising, and we're making money off, off those uh, titles as well. So uh, there's many different approaches, but you know, if you can, find get everything with market will bear, but that is ultimately going to give the, uh, the guidance for you, I think. Thank you. A uh, question down here? Here, I maybe even go. Thank you. I, uh, I want to direct this to uh, Harry and, and to others. Could you talk a little bit? Yes. Uh, I am interested in the opportunity with the way the store works, and I don't know much about a subscription to an application. And also, is, if not a subscription, are there version updates for which you can get additional revenue? And is that uh, attractive uh, in terms of the history so far? <clears throat> well, uh, so in terms of updates to the application, what you find is that Apple distributes those to users for free. So if you end up adding like a, a bunch of new features in what you say is simply a revision of an existing application, um, uh, your existing user base gets all of that new functionality for no money. Um, so you can either spin off the application or you know, into a, a deluxe version of what you already had. Um, what Apple just introduced in um, version 3.0 of the iPhone OS software is a facility called in-app purchasing um, where you can actually uh, create, a, uh, there's a mechanism by which you can actually let users um, purchase items from within uh, the application and uh, you know, an outlay of additional money to the extent that you could, say, uh, allow an application to be downloaded free, but then have premium content inside the application that they have to pay additional money um, in order to access. Um, that could be used as part of a, a subscription service on the iPhone. Um, uh, there are, uh, I would say that would be the, the, the cheapest way of doing it, at least from the, you know, the one-man point of view like me. Harry, Harry, when you have that premium content, mm -hmm. it's purchased, is the purchaser purchasing it directly from you, 
Or does it go through Apple? And no, that, that again goes through um, you know the Apple uh, system, the Apple uh, uh, you know the, the, their coffers. With the result that um, again they take their thirty percent cut of um, anything that you sell. You happen to sell that way, but at the same time they're handling you know all aspects of payment. You know the extent that you don't have to become a credit card processor or handle any aspect of uh, the you know the payment side of things on your own. So you know, there's a trade-off there, but for a, you know a, a small developer like me, that is so much uh, better than actually uh, having to go out and manage you know payment myself. Question here. Let me. Uh, the, the question is actually two parts. Uh, the first part is given that there's, and it's to anyone on the panel, that there are about a hundred thousand applications whether or not if something is very similar or a replica to something that exists out there, if there is any sort of patent or copyright issues, as long as you do the programming yourself. And second of all, if you're linking up any of those applications to something that's on the web, so for example, what Harry, you know, you're linking it up to information that was um, specifically on the web itself, if there are any issues from a legal standpoint or a copyright standpoint that Apple monitors or somebody else comes and says this application has to be taken off. Protection issues? Yeah. Uh, I, I can, as a fair amount of experience with it. Um, what, one thing you didn't mention and should be mentioned, and, and one of the challenges for a new developer or for any developer on the iPhone is that Apple fully expects that uh, you will own or have full licenses for all the IP uh, in your games, in your applications. Uh, in other words, you own this original work uh, or you've paid someone or pieces of it, in our, in, the, in our case, with respect to games, music has to be paid for or licensed, art has to be paid for or licensed or created originally. Um, there are, uh, you know, any, any of the touches that we have in our games, they, you know, they, that has to all be accounted for. Uh, and, and Apple, uh, if they're challenged, will take, will take the game or the application right down. They, they won't even spend three seconds uh, having a debate about it. It's up, for, it's up to the developer to, to honor uh, you know, the IP considerations in their, in their work and uh, to resolve them if, in fact, there's a problem. So it's very important you, you, you attend to that before you actually take your market, your, your, your uh, application uh, out to the marketplace. Other questions? And I, it better not be for David, because it looks like he's vanished uh, from, the, uh, from the scene. Way in the, uh, in the rear. My question is for Matthew. Why not target type 2 since that's the larger demographic? That's a pretty good question. Um, we are thinking about expanding to the type 2 demographic, however, just that uh, my brother and I were so much more familiar with the type 1 demographic that we felt as our initial application, as we were learning how to build the application and everything, since we understood the ins and outs of type 1 diabetes a little bit better, we wanted to target type 1 diabetes. Um, now, obviously, it is probably, it'd be much better for us in terms of uh, revenue and reaching to more customers if we did develop it for type 2 diabetics, which is something that we're moving towards. But the main reason we didn't do it is just we weren't familiar with uh, treatments of type 2 diabetes nearly as well as we are with type 1. An additional question? Ah. Click on Phil. While we're waiting for the microphone to get up there, I, I might just add on to, uh, to what Matt said. I, say, I think this is one of the, uh, the, the, the biggest and most important lessons to know about iPhone application development early on is uh, don't try to do too much uh, because if you end up making a, a, a huge outlay of effort into an application that no one ends up using and you've wasted how much of your life doing it. Um, so um, you know, it, I think it's highly useful simply to, to think about what you know and then to, to implement that but do it very well. You'll be right. much more successful that way. So, so it seems like uh, a lot of the best-selling apps, the, a lot of the growth in the, the Apple app platform is social apps, gaming apps, and kind of that seems like kind of a contrast to a lot of the growth, say, like uh, originally with the personal PC, driven by the productivity software, business, business applications. I'm wondering if uh, people have opinions 
if that's going to change uh, on the, the Apple platform, or is it more because BlackBerry is kind of more of the business uh, mobile device? Yeah, um, my uh, expectation is that uh, the the Apple platform and its uh, imitations uh, will become much more significant in, uh, in the business realm over the next few years. Yeah. So um, I was just saying that I, I, uh, my expectation is that the the platform, uh, the Apple as well as the Google Android and and probably uh, some version of the BlackBerry Storm will become a uh, very popular platform for business applications going forward. Um, my personal focus has never been in, in gaming, so uh, I have a little bias there in that statement, but I, I'm trying to get positioned so that uh, I can take advantage of the move toward uh, productivity, business type applications before it really starts taking off. Uh, I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator and ask the last question of, of each of each of you, and I'm going to start with uh, you, David. Uh, welcome back. We're, you're, you, can you hear us okay? I can, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'll tell uh, you for a minute. Look into the crystal ball. Uh, and I imagine everyone's thought a little bit about this, but uh, what's this industry going to be like in five years? Would this be like uh, a million little proprietorships and individual companies, or do you envision that there may be some major companies that, that develop out of uh, iPhone applications? Well, uh, I certainly hope it's the latter. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that a lot of the buzz out here in Silicon Valley, at least, is, uh, you know, is drawing comparisons between kind of the, the current uh, buzz with the, you know, the application store and all of the new mobile platforms, uh, comparing that to what it was 10 years ago with the, with the internet boom. Um, and I think there are, you know, parts of that comparison are, are pretty valid. You know, what, what Apple and Android and, and all these other platforms have done is kind of, you know, open up this new form of distribution to allow, you know, people with an idea to go and, and hit, you know, millions of people with their ideas. Um, which is exactly the same thing that the internet did 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, I, I think it will probably shake out in a very similar way to, to the way that the internet has, in, in, this, in the sense that, you know, there are some pretty dominant players that will emerge, um, but there's still room for, you know, small small companies and small developers to, uh, to still have an impact. Uh, do you have, Matt, do you have some thoughts about that? Uh, I would uh, agree with what David's saying in that I think it's kind of it's going to continue a little bit how it is now, and that you're going to have big companies like Skyworks and others like that. But um, just the way that Apple's made the platform, how easy it is to develop an app or a, a specific app like Harry or I have done that target a specific audience. I think that there's always going to be small developers and small companies who can easily get into the market and they might not cut out a big market share and have uh, as much revenue as some of these other companies. But I still think that the way the platform's built, there's going to be a pretty wide variety of the size of companies involved. Ideal for entrepreneurs, right? Uh, Harry? <clears throat> I mean, the, I think that uh, what Apple has done for the, um, you know, the, the smartphone development universe is to make it or bring it about as close to the development process for a, a standard personal computer as it's ever going to get um, to the extent that, I mean, you have kind of room for both universes. You have the little academics like me who go out and build a tool that will be useful to some people and put in a you know, commensurately small amount of time and money effort um, and then there will be, you know, much larger opportunities for, you know, for bigger killer apps and you know, games, social networking, that type of stuff. And then I think those types of markets, I think, will tend to be dominated by, you know, the larger companies that have the, you know, the, the large amounts of uh, capital, the resources to uh, develop those things quickly. And that's going to be the big thing about the, uh, the iPhone application universe is that uh, it because part of the, the part of what happens because it's so easy to develop is that there's going to be a massive turnover in terms of just tons and tons and tons of applications being written uh, and available to the extent that, um, you know, what might be the, uh, the great and cool thing uh, one day might next week be uh, kind of uh, old and busted. So in the, the speed of the development universe is going to make it difficult, uh, I think more difficult for, uh, you know, a larger, slower uh, company to be able to react to changes in the market. I mean, my, uh, my colleagues up there might disagree with me. But. 
And uh, Ken, you can probably look at this both as an investor as well as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I, I am a little bit uh, wary. Um, I won't say skeptical because I, I, I'm optimistic, but I'm, I'm wary that uh, uh, this market is going to remain fragmented for a long time. Now, that's good for people starting out, but if you become an established player, you'd love to be able to consolidate your gains and become a, uh, become a giant. But given the current uh, structure of the market, I, I rather doubt it, especially on the iPhone platform where 30% uh, is uh, going to Apple. And that doesn't sound like a lot uh, for what they offer, uh, the ease of distribution, the payment, and so on. But to get, uh, to get to be a big company with a lot of leverage in the market, trying to get through that Apple funnel is, is not a, uh, a good way to do business. Now, on the Android, maybe, because that's, that's completely open-ended. But given the structure of the iPhone market, I don't think there's going to be one dominant software player. It's going to remain very fragmented over the next 10 years. And, and Sharon, I will give you the last word on uh, what the industry looks like from your vantage point. Yeah. Well, I think I'm in between, I think, with all these points of view. I think it's in certain categories, um, it, it could stay more fragmented for a while. I do think in the consolidation, in every category to some degree. And gaming, I will tell you, I think there's going to be major consolidation in the not too distant future because even EA and GameLoft, which are two gigantic gaming companies around the world, uh, enormous in size, billions and billions in, in sales, uh, they still have very, very small uh, footprint within the total gaming uh, market. Just as a little aside, what Apple is doing. It, it, Apple's doing the gaming right now what it did to music. <laughs> it's, it's taking uh, what was a $20 purchase at one time for a music CD and turning it into the 99 cent purchase of the only of the one game, one song you actually wanted. They're doing the same thing now in gaming, which is great. A lot of dislocation. Uh, you know, people are accustomed to, to buying $59.99 titles for uh, <clears throat> for their Xboxes and Wii's and so forth, and now it's been turned into 99 cents and dollar 99 purchases. For the same games, um, you know, so therefore all the gaming companies are rethinking. But I do think you're going to see a lot of consolidation, so they can get critical mass and, and get their leadership positions established. It's, it's going to be very interesting over the next year or two. Small categories, or business categories, others. Um, if there's no big player to jump in, I think it will be a, you know an indie opportunity. But you know, if you have big players in the category, they're going to eventually, I think, get very interested in, and and probably buy up. You know, a lot of the independent developers who are around today. So it's, it's a good news story for developers for sure. Uh, Sharon, and thank you, and, and uh, I hope you heal quickly and uh, get around. Yeah, thank and thanks, uh, David, and all of our panelists, and, and all of you, and particularly our sponsors for making this uh, happen. We have a reception uh, that uh, is available right outside, uh, and uh, in addition, there are uh, some cards that, that are sort of postcard size cards that you may have seen. This announces a contest uh, for an application uh, for the, where the uh, deadline is next March. But if you're a student, graduate student or undergraduate student, and you're interested in developing an application, this has to do with the alcohol. Thank